It's 2016 and two trains in Germany come together in a major collision on single line bi-directional track. How does that happen in 2016 with all the computers, with all the telecommunications, with all the modern age signalling? In one of the most advanced countries in the world, we're not talking about a, a third world train wreckage here. We're talking about Germany and two trains colliding on single line bi-directional track. Well, in actual fact, this is a very old story. I want you to come with me on a journey now back to 1878 in Australia and see what happened. The year is 1878. The tiny hamlet of Emu Plains sits quietly below the majestic Blue Mountains west of Sydney. On its escarpment sits an engineering feat marked by the Knapsack Gully Viaduct, a magnificent sandstone structure which can be viewed for miles around. Known as the Lapstone Zigzag, the railway line zigzags up the steep escarpment. Its construction was overseen by John Whitton, New South Wales Railway's chief engineer and one of the leading rail engineers in the world during the 19th century. The Blue Mountains line is a single line of track that crosses the Blue Mountains. This is another picture of it taken in the 19th century of the little town called Valley Heights. The Blue Mountains is scattered with little villages like this. The rail line over the Blue Mountains has been constructed by Witten at a time that would embarrass most engineering firms today. The line reached Penrith at the foot of the mountains by 1862. This is a picture of Penrith station as it then was. By 1869 the line had completely crossed the mountains to Bowenfells, by 1870 to Rydal by 1876 to Bathurst, by 1877 to Orange, and by 1881 to Dubbo. Between 1870 and 1880, the passenger rail traffic had gone from 776,707 passenger journeys to 5,440,138 passenger journeys, all in the space of 10 years. So the pressure, not for the last time, was on rail management to make the railways more efficient. With so much traffic, the single lines were inadequate for the increased two-way demand for track access. This demand led to pressure on the safe working systems to free up the flow of traffic. This culminated in a horrific tragedy on the 30th of January 1878, when two trains collided head-on at Emu Plains. At a few minutes after 11 o'clock on Wednesday night, a through goods train collided with an up special goods train at Emu Plains, just at the bottom of the Lapstone Hill incline. The trucks piled up high, one on top of the other, and somehow caught fire, burning fiercely, casting a lurid reflection over the surrounding hills. The merchandise and the coal were in flames and scattered over the line in broken heaps. The engine drivers and the firemen 
had been cut to pieces. Two political giants ruled the New South Wales Railways. John Whitten, the Chief Engineer, and John Sutherland, the Minister for Railways. John Whitten wanted no change at all. He resisted the idea of staff and ticket. On the other hand, John Sutherland wanted reform. He wanted to have trains that were more freely running, and he wanted more efficient train running. To this end, each tried to exert their influence in the railways. Sutherland appointed Donald Vernon, who introduced working orders. And Whitten acted through Commissioner Ray, who cancelled the very same working orders. Thus the railways were effectively divided into two camps, and the staff didn't know who to follow. So what was the difference between Witten's regulations and Vernon's working orders. Well, under Witten's regulations, a train that crossed another train had to arrive 15 minutes before that service was advertised to leave in the other direction. This contrasted with Vernon's working orders, which gave discretion to the guard and basically said if there was a doubt that a station master should telegraph ahead asking whether the line was clear and if that clearance came the 15 minutes could be disregarded and basically that it was up to the guards to space the trains provided that they had the written telegraph from the station master assuring them that the line was clear. The problem with telegraphs of course is that both parties have to cooperate and send them and if half the staff are not following the same rules, this is very hard. At Kelso, this blew up on November the 5th, 1877, when Station Master Pass at Kelso sent on a freight train after sending a telegraph, but Station Master Higgs at Bathurst also sent a freight train at the same time, but he didn't send a telegraph. The head-on collision was averted by a horseman who spotted the collision, or potential collision, from a hilltop. Man of management ramifications for this were very rapid. Vernon immediately blamed Higgs and commended Pass. He suspended Higgs. However, Witten intervened through Commissioner Ray and he blamed Pass and reinstated Higgs. Minister Sutherland, whose power was quite in the ascendancy in December, reinstated Pass promoted Vernon and demoted Witten. So now where are we up to? The entire railways is in a mess. The staff don't know who to follow. Some station managers want to follow Commissioner Ray and go to the old regulations. Others want to follow traffic manager Vernon and send line clear reports. But the problem is now that with half the station masters not doing line clear reports, even if you wanted to do one as a station master, there's no guarantee that your neighbouring station master will oblige you. And then we have the situation with the guards. Is it up to the guards discretion or is it not? In other words, the staff don't know who to follow, and as a result, the safe working questions are huge. So now we come to the sad conclusion of the story. This is Locomotive 103, which was involved in the head-on collision. On the evening in question, driver John Egan, his fireman John Larkins, and the guard George Purdue set out from Bowenfells on a special goods train of nine trucks of kerosene shale oil from Bowenfells. The train passed Katoomba at 8.25, weatherboard, today known as Wentworth Falls, at 8.50, and arrived at Blue Mountain, today known as Lawson, at 9.25. There, Station Master John King leapt aboard the train, and it was a very slow-moving train, to ask the guard what he intended to do. 
George Perdue indicated that he would cross the down goods train at Wasco Siding, that is Glenbrook. He would go to Glenbrook and wait for the freight train. Thus, King sent this information to the Penrith station master by telegraph. And from then on, the train's fate was sealed. Somewhere between Lawson and Glenbrook, guard Perdue changed his mind. He must have thought that he could make Penrith, where he lived, by 11 o'clock. But also, that this freight train he was crossing was quite often late. So he obviously thought that he could make it in time. His watch was later found to be 25 minutes slow, but surprisingly in those days many stations had no clocks at all, including Lawson. 45 minutes was the normal time for going down the lapstone zigzag, but guard Perdue obviously thought that he could do it in about 15 minutes. Today the lapstone zigzag is a walking trail. As we go down the hill we can imagine what those final moments before the crash would have been like. The driver of the up freight train, Egan, and the fireman of the down freight train, Wiggins, were buried here at Emu Plain Cemetery, very close to the accident site. All up, five train crew died. Guard Perdue was charged with manslaughter. At his trial, Defence Counsel raised the management civil war over safe working within the railways as a defence. This was ruled inadmissible by the judge. However, the jury recommended mercy and guard Perdue was sentenced to two years of hard labour at Parramatta Jail. Subsequently, management expedited the introduction of ordinary staff and ticket working and block telegraph working almost immediately and ordered the required equipment from England and the ghost of emu planes became part of Australian history forever.